So in, uh, in 2014, I had the unique pleasure of telling hundreds of thousands of Canadians that they were too dumb for democracy. Uh, my work was featured in an episode of CBC Radio's Ideas, and so for 59 minutes or so, uh, listeners were taken on this journey through the many ways that we fail to live up to the ideal of the rational and autonomous political decision maker. For that hour, I guided them through this exploration of, of the many ways that we screw up. You know, the ways that we, we manipulate ourselves or, or one another, the ways that we rationalize our way to deciding who to vote for or what to think about an issue. Now, so I listened to this episode at home as it aired, and uh, when it ended, I, I sat down on my couch, and I turned off my radio, and I poured myself a drink, and, uh, you know, two fingers, and, and I... <laughs> And I waited. I had, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer and an academic and a public intellectual, and, and so, you know, I've been called a, a lot of nasty things. And I, I had just got done telling a lot of people that they were too dumb to do something they'd been doing their entire lives, and so, and that they were expected to keep doing. And so I thought, okay, well, here it comes. You know, because in the past I've been called, oh, I've been called a lot of nasty stuff, uh, dumb partisan, stupid, ugly, mean, and those, that's just from my fans. And, and <laughs> one, one reader actually once wrote in to say that I hope, she hoped I had so much in student debt that I'd have to write these articles for the rest of my life to pay it off. <laughs> so uh, I went to bed that night, you know, waiting for the worst, and, and I wake up the next morning and I go over to my email, as, as I do, and I, and I hold my breath and I open up my computer and I read the first email, and there it is, this glowing review. I wasn't used to it, so I read the next one, another glowing, and another one, and another one. All these praiseworthy, encouraging, really kind things. So I couldn't understand, I didn't know what to do, I wasn't used to positive feedback, and so I was like, I kept reading, <laughs> and then I, but then I came to it, the, the Rosetta Stone that unlocked the mystery of why everyone was being so cool about being critiqued. Dear Dave, it read, I really enjoyed your episode of Ideas last night about why we're too dumb for democracy. I know just the person you're talking about. <laughs> My neighbor. <laughs> so people had, what people had done was exempted themselves from my critique of the bad political decision maker. Because, I mean, of course they did, right? It's, it's easy to crit criticize others. It, it's hard to criticize ourselves. So it wasn't surprising that people had thought that I was talking about someone else. But well, the truth is we're all bad political decision makers, all of us, you and, and me and your neighbor and your friends and your families and your lawyer, your doctor, your member of parliament. <laughs> but the question is why? Well, let's go back to the 18th century, to the Age of Enlightenment. This is when philosophers and artists and scientists cried, sapere ode, dare to know. So they, they went back to the antiquity to the Greeks, and they looked forward to the future, and they, they painted this ideal of reason and, and rationality, and they thought of us as these dispassionate, calm, political decision-making machines. And then over the years, we came to buy that. That became our idea of what a, what a good political decision-maker was. That's, like, that's what we thought we needed to strive for, and that's what we thought we could. We would put emotion off to the side. And then as democracy evolved, as liberal democracy evolved, we took that notion of the individual and we put it right in the middle. That's who we were. Now, liberalism from day one betrayed its own lofty ambitions, right? It excluded all kinds of people from public discourse, for instance, on the base of race or gender, but it did establish this ideal of, of the good political decision maker. But they had it wrong. This isn't us. For one, we're not all white and wearing powdered wigs, but, but conceptually this isn't us. This isn't who we are. We're not the calm, dispassionate, rational, reasoning machines. No, 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 no. We're passionate, and we're partisan, and we're biased, and we're prejudiced, and we get tired, and we get cranky, and we forget things. Um, we didn't evolve to make good political decisions. This is us. What a mess, right? So, 
don't get me wrong, we're, we're impressive creatures, right? We, we can do impressive things, and we have, but we didn't evolve to be these rational, you know, calculative machines that come up with political decisions. We evolved for a very different time, a very simpler time, a less complex time, not for this information age society where we're being constantly bombarded with all this stuff. But because we're clever, we're able to build out these institutions and practices and shortcuts that help us make decisions. For instance, I've written, can you see that? I don't know if you can see it. I've written on my hand some stuff that I thought I might forget. <laughs> huh? We call that a heuristic. But, th but that's who we are. So even when we try to build out these practices, we still make mistakes. We're still subject to hij being hijacked, to sort of trying to rationalize these decisions, to use our emotion to reach conclusions. That that's who we are. So we build these things out, but, but they're imperfect. So clever. But despite the fact that we haven't evolved to do this, we can still make good, rational, autonomous political decisions. That's still possible. But it won't come easily, and it won't come naturally. It's not the default, right? Especially given the environment that we live in. So in his book, The Organized Mind, the uh, psychologist and neuroscientist Dan Levitin writes that in 2011, Americans took in about five times as much information as they did in 1986. Five times. And that was in 2011. And the same is true of Canadians. That means that during our off time, just after work, we'd take in about 100,000 words, or 34 gigabytes of information. It's a ton. It's about how much Netflix I watch in a day. And so, <laughs> we take in all this information, so by the end of the day, we're just like, we're so exhausted, we don't have any time to do political decisions, we don't have the time to, to really think this stuff through. And what's worse, the pace of our lives is unprecedented, right? You wake up in the morning, you hustle to work, you hustle home, you do your errands, you multitask all day long, you dart from Facebook message to Twitter notification to email to text to phone and back again. So not only are you exhausted, you've got no time. And on top of all of that, as if it wasn't hard enough to make a good political decision, there are people out there whose job it is to make it even harder. Partisan actors, strategic actors, people whose job it is to know how you think, to know how you actually make decisions, and to work to hijack that process to try to get you to vote for their candidate or to support their issue. They don't want to persuade you, they want to manipulate you, and they know how to do it. They use you know, priming and framing, these ways of wording and contextualizing information to try to persuade you. And in the internet era, it's easier than ever. So that's what we're dealing with. So that's the bad news. Here's the really bad news. Uh, <laughs> there's a reason that I don't go last in these things. They're only walking out the door like this. So, <laughs> the, historically, democracy has been a, a, a bad bet, a terrible bet. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of time to build a system of self-government in which the, the people rule, and yet, like that, it can be gone overnight. In Athens, ancient Athens, democracy lasted for about 200 years. In the Roman Republic, which wasn't very democratic to begin with, uh, democracy lasted for about 500 years. When that fell, the word democracy, if it was used at all, was a bad word. It referred to mob rule. By the 19th century, we had, democracy had recovered a little bit, and you had these fledgling democratic states in the US and France and, and England, but they weren't what we think of as democracies. In Canada, we got universal democracy in about 50 years ago. That was when every Canadian of age was eligible to vote, except for those who were incarcerated. So we extended the vote to prisoners in, in the 1990s. But despite the fact that more people than ever are eligible to vote, voter turnout is low, especially among young people. And participation in self-government is even lower. Who cares? So what? Well, it took a lot of effort to get democracy, to get the rights and freedoms that we use to enjoy the lives that we have. People literally died to secure it. In parts of the world, they're still dying. And now democracy is under siege worldwide. The rise of authoritarians, populist authoritarians, alienation, apathy, uh, inequality, deep frustration and anger. 
And so it's no surprise that in some countries, democracy is stagnant, and in other countries, it's in retreat. Not that I'm thinking of any countries in particular. <laughs> I'm not here to editorialize. So what are we going to do when the, when the crises really hit, when the worst of climate change or nuclear proliferation or isolationism or, or nationalism or armed conflict? What are we going to do then? We risk a perfect storm that blows democracy out to sea. We risk losing it all. So, so what are we going to do about it? The cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. Just at the moment when you want to pull back and say, whoa, we don't trust these people, is the moment you want to bring them back in. Liberal democracy encourages us to think of ourselves as individuals, as alone, as separate, as isolated, and as above all, self-interested. But that's exactly the wrong impulse. What we need to do is move back to a citizen-centered model where we think of people as, as part of a, of a community, as a society of, of decision makers who can come together and take the time and energy and effort that we need to, to form good decisions together. So this is where we come to the good news uplifting bit that I promised I would finish with. We can do this. We can get this done. And there's a whole bunch of ways that we can do it, but I'm going to focus on, because we're limited cognitively, we can only take in so much at once, I'm going to focus on two things. One thing that you can do, and one thing that you can demand that governments do. So here's the first thing. The next time you're asked to make a political decision, to decide who to vote for, or to offer your opinion about something, I want you to take 15 minutes or so, whatever time you got, to make yourself uncomfortable to ask yourself a couple of questions. Why do I support this candidate or this position? Where, where does that come from? What's driving? What are my motivations? I want you to kick yourself off of cognitive autopilot, to really dig in and, and to think about where you're coming from, and to accept that it's OK not to know. It's OK to doubt yourself. It's OK to change your mind. That may seem easy, but it's not. So during that quarter of an hour, I want you to Go look at a source or two that you wouldn't usually consider. Not Fox News, but <laughs> something that you wouldn't usually... Don't have to go all the way down to the middle, it's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> go talk to someone who disagrees with you, take their side of the argument, argue against yourself, challenge yourself. Except that it's okay to be emotional when it comes to politics, because we're not reasoning machines, we're emotional too, and that's information, and that's wisdom, and that's telling you something. When it's all said and done, sit down and very briefly write out an account of what you believe and the reasons you believe it. In the future, repeat the process. Add a couple minutes. Carve out that space and that time to say, I'm a citizen, and I'm going to take this time to do my job, because democracy depends upon it. Practice it. Make it a habit. Now, that's what we can do as individuals. What about what government needs to do? This is what we need to tell government to do. The occasional town hall or knock on the door from a party who wants your vote isn't enough. Citizens need to be brought into the political decision-making sphere on a regular basis so that they can develop preferences, to communicate them to their, to their representatives, and to see them expressed in policy and in law on a regular basis. There's a bunch of ways to do that. My favorite way is, is the citizens' assembly. A bunch of people come together, they learn about an issue, they deliberate with one another, they produce a recommendation, and they share it with their representatives or with their peers. And that way you build civic capacity and skills, and you create a good cycle of democratic decision-making. Democracy can be taken for granted. Each generation needs to recommit to protecting the foundation upon which our common lives are built our reason, our empowerments, our, our freedoms, our, our rights. And even better, we need to extend that even further and to bring more people in. We can commit to doing that. We can commit to doing that by carving out the time and a little bit of energy we, we need to put in the effort to making good political decisions and demanding from government that they do the same. If we do that, we can get a better democracy. We may not have evolved to make good political decisions. 
but we can use our reason, our emotion, our institutions, our government to do just that if we're willing to put in the time and the effort. And in so doing, we might find that not only is our public life enriched, but our private lives will be enhanced and strengthened and secured. At the very least, we owe it to ourselves and to future generations to try. Thank you.